Bill, you're muted, brother. You're going to have to restart. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Red May. It's our seventh day of our fifth year. Uh, and uh, we've got, what, 23 more days to go in our 30-day vacation from capitalism. Uh, so before we get into today's event, what we talk about when we talk about Marx, I want to fill you in for what's ahead on the agenda. Uh, tomorrow at uh, 11 a.m. Uh, on Saturday is a talk by Michael Heinrich. The Political Impact of Marxist Form Analysis. Uh, Michael rarely talks about the political impact. So uh, this is a kind of, this is a moment where a lot of us will learn exactly what value form, how value form affects your, uh, your own militancy at uh, ground level. At least we hope so. Um, at 3 p.m., a red deal with the humble people of the earth uh, uh, from red media. Uh, uh, they've come out with a book called The Red Deal, Indigenous Action to Save Our Earth, which they will talk about. On Sunday, workers' autonomy from Detroit to Turin and beyond. That's at uh, 10 a.m. on Sunday the 9th. Uh, and on Tuesday, May 11th at 11 a.m., class power on zero hours, strategies for the current moment from the Angry Workers Collective. Uh, you may wonder how we uh, fund Red May. Uh, there are no institutions that uh, give us money. Uh, there's not a lot of funding for an event whose slogan, one of whose slogans is the economy for a month. So we depend on your generosity. Uh, you can manifest it in two places uh, on our GoFundMe, Fan the Flames of Red May, and uh, also on our website, website www.redmayseattle.org. Uh, there's a donate button there and there are various options. You can become a Patreon member and make a monthly donation, but uh, uh, please be generous because we enjoy doing this and we hope you enjoy watching it. And now uh, let me uh, turn it over to our two uh, uh, discussants today, uh, Jason Smith and uh, Paul Maddock. Uh, Paul Maddock is the, among other things, is the author of Theory as Critique and Social Knowledge, which are both in the Historical Materialism series and uh, from Haymarket, uh, originally from Brill when it was sold to libraries at high prices. And then uh, he's also the author of Business as Usual, which was, uh, I remember, an analysis of the financial crisis when all of us were reaching around for anything that kind of addressed what was going on on some sort of deeper level. Uh, uh, Jason Smith, uh, who, who has written on many things from Badieu to Spinoza and Hegel, uh, and also wrote uh, an article on Jacobin, which had, had the wonderful and wonderfully unfair title, Let Us Be Terrible. <laughs> Uh, Jason is the uh, author of uh, a book called Smart Devices and Service Work, which uh, we've done a number of programs on at Red May that's uh, published by uh, a new book series that's edited by Paul Maddock and that uh, stems from his uh, 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 page called Field Notes in the Brooklyn Rail, which is one of the uh, best sources of uh, reflection on the current moment. So without further ado, Paul and Jason, you're on. Thanks very much for having us, uh, Philip and Red May. And I, I just wanted to thank uh, you again for having me. I think this is the third time I've, I've, I've done this kind of great uh, event. The first time actually in person, which is really, really extraordinary. And I hope that I can do that again one day. Um, I guess I'm going to start, I mean, since you mentioned field notes, I wanted to start maybe with a, a recent, uh, with a kind of a discussion of a recent piece that Paul wrote in the, I think it's the, uh, the May, yeah, it's the May issue of, uh, of field notes, um, which as you mentioned is Paul's kind of edited section of the Brooklyn Rail. And so I have a few thoughts I'd like to sort of um, run by Paul as a kind of a way of starting to approach in a kind of empirical way the question that you know we're going to sort of 
address in this uh, discussion. But I guess I'd first um, wanted to ask Paul uh, to say a little bit more about Field Notes and maybe its origins and how he sees the kind of Field Notes project, which is a kind of, it's interesting in a way because the Brooklyn Rail to me is a kind of uh, art magazine um, as much as anything. I mean, there's a kind of literary side of it and, and, and that sort of thing as well, but it's primarily a, an art magazine. Uh, and I know that Paul has been editing it for probably 15, 20 years now. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe longer, I'm not even sure. Um, I know that I first read Paul's writing in the context of an interview he did uh, in the Brooklyn Rail, probably around 2010. Uh, it, was, it was in the kind of aftermath of the financial crisis and Paul wrote a series of, of um, I guess what would become uh, chapters of his book, Business as Usual, which I think was published in 2011, 2012. And it's still the definitive account of the 2008 crisis or the 2008 and crisis and its aftermath, which in some sense is kind of an ongoing uh, sort of um, rolling catastrophe. Um, so I guess I'll start there, Paul. You wanna say something a little bit about Field Notes? Of course, uh, as Phil, Philip mentioned also, um, it's also now a book series with reaction books. So it has these kind of, various um, tentacles that are um, kind of moving in various directions. And I thought Paul maybe could say something about that before we start with his, his text. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you, Phil. Thank you everybody who's involved with this project. Um, the Brooklyn Rail actually started out being largely 20 odd years ago, being concerned with politics and then sort of expanded as uh, a man named Fong Bui, who is an artist and very concerned with the development of the art scene in Brooklyn, got involved in it and gradually put over more and more and made it into a literary and art magazine. But it always had a political section, which was largely focused on Brooklyn and Brooklyn affairs and sort of local Brooklyn politics uh, and was uh, actually pretty interesting. And the guy who edited it, who had started the rail got tired of it after a while and said, I quit. I had known Fong for a very long time. And he just called me up and said, you want to be the politics editor of the Brooklyn Rail? I said, sure. I had, that's, that's how it happened. I thought, originally I thought, oh, well, I'll try to always have something about Brooklyn and then something larger about the United States maybe, and then something international, that that would be a way I could begin to sort of shift its territory. And it began with just my finding, finding people who would write, that that's, which is always the problem with these things, although that's become less and less of a problem. Now more and more people just send me articles and more and more of them are really good. So that's all, that's a very, as far as I'm concerned, a big success. And I called it Field Notes because my idea is that it, sh it should be journalism. It's very theoretically informed, but it's about what's going on in the world now. And it's an attempt to figure at the art. I, my goal is that the article should represent people's attempt to figure out what's actually happening in the world and how to understand it. And as it developed, it's, I started in 2014. So it's been going for six, seven years now. And uh, it's, it's pretty good. If you look at it every month, there's something worth reading for, for the last six or seven years. And it's funny that you want to start with this because I found after a few months that I was beginning to think of it as a kind of, on the model of the Marx's original Rheinische Zeitung during the uh, 1848 revolution. And then he, um, uh, tried again a little bit later before the censors closed down his publication and that it should not represent my personal point of view. That's not the job of an editor, but it represents it just as the Rheinische Zeitung represented at, for Marx what he considered the most advanced voices uh, commenting on what was going on in Germany and Europe in, the, in, in, the, in that revolutionary moment. And I thought, I've been trying to do something very similar, which is to find people who are radical. They don't necessarily have to agree with me, although there are certain limits. For example, we are not going to promote candidates for particular candidates for office. But if somebody, for example, 
we printed Noam Chomsky, who advised people to vote for Joe Biden. So that shows how liberal minded we could be. Um, but sort of no, like no outright Stalinists, no outright Democratic Party hacks, uh, no powers, but that leaves a rather large range of opinion. And I'm more interested in trying to represent the range of opinion to the left of the left in the pages of the, of the rail. So that's sort of how it, how it started and the lines that's been, been going on. And uh, we are very, I'm very happy that we have quite a few international correspondents. Somebody for, is just sending me an article for the June issue who I'd never heard of before, some guy in India he says, you, I read the Brooklyn Rail, I want to write you an article about what's going on in India, how Modi is destroying the country. So that's, it's very, I, I'm very pleased that the readership is international and that the writers are beginning to be more and more international as well as coming from all over the United States. So it's not specifically associated with Brooklyn. Just point, which is because it is, as the rail is, as Jason said, primarily an art magazine, we can do whatever we want. There's no, it's not a political magazine. There's no political line other than the very minimal one, which I described that I set myself. So anything I want to print, I can print. It's, it's completely censor free. Uh, we lost one page because I printed an article by an Israeli, which was very critical about Israel. And some people don't like that. So somebody who was giving money to the rail took it back. But the editor's life, we find another person. He'll, he'll give us money. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a very wonderful opportunity to really just do print anything that seems really good, really informative and intelligent and to the left. So that's basically the... The, the story of the field note section, the Brooklyn Rail. I was going to say too that not only is it international uh, to some, uh, you know, considerable extent, but it's also um, there's a kind of uh, mixing of generations also that you can see oftentimes from month to month. I mean, this this yes. last month in particular. I mean, I, I struck me that you have a younger correspondent from from Paris uh, and uh, your own writing and Jose Tapia and so on and so forth. So it's it's kind of an interesting. Um, because uh, so, on the left, oftentimes these things tend to sort of balkanize into kind of generational uh, sort of sociological patterns. Yes, that's true. Young people from Brooklyn, who are 32, <laughs> maybe some older uh, Marxists who are 75 and have memories of, of uh, other experiences and that sort of thing. I think that that's one of the things that I find most uh, exciting about the journal. I didn't realize you started in 2014 because it, it, obviously those, those pieces you wrote for that became business as usual, those were written before field notes. I wrote for the rail. And I originally right. started but writing about art okay. for the rail, and then I started writing about politics. I see. Okay, I so, understand. I mean, one so of that's how that's how it occurred to Fong. Oh, why don't you become a politics I see. Editor? Okay, I've right. written that a makes number of sense. articles about politics. Yeah, I mean, I should say also since I I, uh, I like you had this this strange art world connection. Um, it's interesting that some of my colleagues uh, will occasionally stumble upon something I've written because they're looking at <laughs> the Brooklyn Rail. So it's a kind of fun, they're like, oh, wow, there's this, I didn't know what you did, you know? Um, I don't know what I do either, but, uh, but nevertheless, that, that's sort of a funny um, uh, sort of occasional circumstance that, that occurs within the context of the Brooklyn Rail. So let's talk a little bit about the most recent piece you wrote. And, and I, I thought we could start with the idea of the Biden boom, the coming Biden boom, which we mm -hmm. all are, Certain very excited uh, about place. Certainly, Paul Krugman uh, writes three or four pieces a week, um, extolling the uh, the coming boom. And I thought we could start maybe uh, not with your piece, but actually with the jobs report that just came out. I don't know if it was today or yesterday, um, but it seems to me I don't know if you saw this, but it's on the front page. I didn't see that. No. Uh, well, apparently, what you know, there's by all accounts the the jobs report was incredibly deflating. Um, there's still, there was only, I think, 250,000 jobs added in April and all the other indicators suggested that it was going to be this kind of uh, explosion and in, in kind of hiring in the job market. And um, what's interesting about the, the jobs report is that um, apparently there's still something like an 8 million um, worker gap between where we yes. were a year ago and where we are now. 
And that all the, there's very, again, very little movement in the job market, but all the movement took place. Um, well, first of all, they all, it was all men, all the gains that in, in mm -hmm. jobs were among men, which says something about what's happening kind of at a deeper layer in the, in the job market. But also black workers, it, it turns out actually, um, the unemployment rate for black workers went up, in fact, over the course of, uh, over the, you know, I guess the course, course of a quarter. And um, of course, these are fluctuating kind of sort of numbers and we can all have sort of theories about why that's the case, but it does sort of suggest, I mean, for example, Republicans and, and uh, people who still can <laughs> pull their heads out of the sand long enough to sort of <laughs> opine about matters uh, suggested, of course, that it's the, uh, the checks, the stimulus checks that have been, has, have been sent out that of course kept people out of the job market because they're living you know, high on the hog uh, with their, you know, whatever it's been, $1,800 over the course of last year. So I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. I mean, maybe you haven't seen it, so it's, uh, but it does strike me as being um, potentially a blip or potentially um, an indicator of a kind of profound shift that's taking place in the job market. And one that in some sense has been kind of, ex one that's a kind of a long-term trajectory that really begins around 2000 with, uh, I think the peak in the labor force participation rate is, is around 2000 or so. It's like 65% or something like that. And we've seen in the last 20 years, a just total collapse of that rate. Mm -hmm. um, and in some sense, it was, it was uh, in a kind of free fall really uh, during the, uh, the crisis from 2008 on. And I wonder if, in fact, we're going to see um, a kind of so-called jobless recovery, you know, um, of the mm -hmm. sort we've come, become familiar with, in which, in some sense, all those jobs which are supposed to come back with this infusion of trillions of dollars into the economy just don't reappear. Um, <laughs> that's a thought I had, um, but maybe, maybe it's not something that we want to talk about. Maybe it's a comment. No, I think, and actually, it's something I would like to talk about, because you are much more of an expert on jobs and the job market than I am. But I... I, I can just throw in one or two thoughts, uh, which is there are two. The, everyone expects the boom because it is true. They are, throw, they are printing trillions of dollars and handing them out, but they're mostly handing them out to corporations. Right. And most, just as during the pandemic, is going to the large the corporations that already have the most money and are doing the best already and to the richest people. So for example, they, they allocated $46 billion for people who can't pay their rent. So far, no one has gotten a cent of that money. It will disappear and be, be given to an airline or something. But uh, so the, the, the problem is that even before the pandemic, the economy was entering into a period of very serious economic downturn with very low, very historically high levels of corporate debt, as well as government debt and personal debt, with met very large percentages of corporations, you know, 20% say of our zombie firms, as you call them in your book, which and everybody calls them now, right. which uh, borrow money but don't make any profit and even the companies companies which are on seem very very successful like uber or uh, um, lyft and, and many other of these sort of gig gig economy companies don't actually make any profit at all um, they they exist entirely on debt but they have multi-billion dollar losses so the economy was not doing very well then came this disaster of the pandemic and there was an, an, an attempt which is quite rational but as usual only half-heartedly rational they wanted to sort of stop it a little but then they were afraid of really destroying the economy completely then they would actually have to pay people's rent and give the money and so forth so you had this sort of half-assed of shutting down the economy but now that uh, even now that the pandemic is beginning to go down, it's not as though suddenly we're returning to prosperity. There's, it's the same sort of low stagnation, quasi depression that we were going into in 2019, 2018, 2019, because they have never really recovered from the Great Recession of 2008. And I would say actually this is a, a, a very, very long term economic decline, which has been going on for decades. So they, just as the, the uh, th this was a moment when people, you know, got rid of a lot of workers and companies are not rehiring them at, at that, that. It's just as simple as that. You know, they're, uh, 
There's another interesting feature of the job market, which is I've read a number of reports that what a, a problem that is popping up in various um, American industries is that people won't work for $7 an hour. Um, I, I can't even remember what it was. I was reading about some company that couldn't get anybody to work for them. They doubled their rate to $15 and, and thousands of people lined up in the street to be hired. So part of the problem is that the companies simply don't want to pay people um, a wage. And at the same time now, uh, illegal immigrants are being blocked from coming in. So you don't have the people who you can force to work at for uh, you know, slave wages. So uh, partly that, you know, you probably could you probably could increase the size of the labor force if companies wanted to pay people twenty five dollars an hour, but nobody wants to do that. So I think there there will be a, a little bit of a boom. You know, there will be office workers in in New York and Los Angeles, and they will have to go out and buy sandwiches, and so there will be more sandwich shops. But that sort of general percolation of money, which was uh, operating earlier in the in the 21st century, I think is probably just over. Um, and yeah. they are preventing the situation from getting even worse by pumping more trillions of dollars into it. If, if they succeed in doing it, there, there's, as you know, there's a huge disagreement within governing circles as to how much to give and uh, whether they really should do that. Because they also really, since they don't actually understand how anything works, they are a little worried that this will have some bad repercussions if you have a national debt, which is several times the size of the gross national product. Yeah, which is I, what I, I tried come to, to the, talk about in that article. Yeah, sorry. Right, I wanna come back to the, the economics profession a little bit because you hit on a point there that's uh, on the kind of disarray of the profession, um, particularly as it's, as it's kind of, um, embodied in a kind of comical form in someone like Larry Summers, but also uh, Olivier Blanchard um, and their own responses to, you know, what they see as a kind of um, fire hose like uh, sort of expenditure being proposed by, by Biden. But I do, I wanna come back, before I come back to that, I wanna to come to a point you make before that, which is that, and you and actually uh, Jose Tapia, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, um, mm -hmm. in his article in, the, in this most recent um, issue, the journal, um, Talk about the relatively small scale intervention that this particular, despite its trillion dollar price tag, this particular um, uh, sort of uh, fiscal sort of initiative um, uh, represents. And in fact, you know, you you in you've done this actually in, in a number of places, and it's a kind of it's a kind of light motif in your work. Mm -hmm. You oftentimes um, point to the fact that if you're going to have the kinds of real effects that a Keynesian kind of uh, uh, demand management type approach is going to have. You need to have um, an intervention that's maybe 10 times the scale of what we're actually getting. And you also need lots of capital, you know, destruction of capital values, right? And including physical destruction. And that's what mm -hmm. that was what was represented by the early, not the, the New Deal and FDR's intervention, but actually the early phases of World War II, when you really mm -hmm. see uh, a kind of boom being prepared and of course, uh, laying the foundations for um, what we now think of as the golden age of the post-war period. So I wanted to maybe ask you a little bit about how you're thinking about the scale of this intervention. Because again, for, you know, you look at what happened last year uh, between the Fed and the, and the kind of um, the sort of stimulus bailout package, there were, you know, it's $5 trillion, $6 trillion. There's another $2 trillion in, in uh, so-called infrastructure that's going to be, and this, this seems quite large. And it, of course it is, adding on to an already uh, historically unprecedented uh, debt levels um, for, for the US government. So how do you sort of think about this question of scale and, and the kind of intervention that's taking place? Well, it sounds more impressive than it, is, than it actually is. You know, <laughs> Mr. Biden says, we're gonna spend $2.3 trillion. He's, oh my God, a trillion dollars, that's a lot of money. Lot, but yeah. It's over eight years. So that's actually only $300 billion a year. As I point out in the article, $300 right. billion is less than the Pentagon spends every year. So it's like all doubling the Pentagon's budget. That's all they're doing. It would nothing. 300, today, you know, individuals own $300 billion. Right. Practically. That, that's like the personal income of Jeb Bezos that he uses <laughs> to buy himself or another wife or whatever he puts his 
his mind to at, at a moment. So it's not, you know, it, it's, it's not that much money. It's, uh, it's something and they have to offer something, but it is not on the scale of World War II because when America entered World War II, the national debt was very, very small. I mean, since the national debt was invented by the British in the 18th century, there every nation has a national debt and that's what governments live on because governments have no money. So governments have to either tax or borrow everything. So the brilliant idea of the British was to invent the national debt and to roll it over all the time. And then, and that turns out to be very nice from the financiers because they get a regular dependable rate of interest, which is then paid by the taxpayers. So in the meantime, the national debt never gets paid, but it, it sort of just keeps going and nobody, it's, it's, there's an income coming in, but it's a way it's stretching out the money. So in, in, at the time of World War II, there was that, but a very small one because uh, neither Hoover nor Roosevelt had actually taken a lot of money to try to deal with the depression. And suddenly, you know, the rate of capital investment collapsed by 50%. The, the government just took the money. And, and then they, of course, gave it to selected industries to build, to build jet planes, and they didn't have jet planes yet, but build bombers and, and bombs and machine guns and atom bombs and so forth. So, um, and it was also the idea that this was just for a short period of time. And then we would win the war and then we would own Europe and the Middle East. We would take over the British and everybody would make lots of money after the war, which is exactly what happened. So it all worked out very well. It was a very good investment. Uh, and that all was great until the 70s when the economy began acting up again and they had to start, the government had to start bailing out the businesses again. But nothing, nobody, they are not really interested in doing it on a large enough scale to seriously problem. Because if, at the moment, the government is responsible for what? It's somewhere between 35 and 40% of the economy is yeah, actually 40, think, government yeah. spending. Yeah, so 43 like even, I think it's a little over 40. Yeah. Whatever, however they calculate yeah. these things. Because all, right. as you know, statistics are largely imaginary, but they, it's a, it gives you, it's a scale idea. It didn't used to be 43%, now it is. So let's say you made it 60%. Well, then you don't really have a capitalist economy anymore. Then you have something like a, a state-run economy with a, some businesses attached, you know, might, maybe like, like as China was and, or might still be, where you have a government which is sort of trying to be business people and have some, give the independent companies a little bit of entrepreneur freedom, but not too much. But in order to do that, you would actually have to wipe out a very large slap of private business. And this is a government which is actually run by private business people. It's the same people, they believe in private business. That's all they're, goal is to serve private business so they're not going to do that so they are they cannot really increase the level of government control of the economy very much so it has to be these little sums 300 billion a year or maybe 500 billion a year and even even that they have to argue about you know so, so the republicans as i say they they their so to speak historical role is to say no you can't do that it's socialism and they other said no it's not socialism we need to have government spending to save capitalism and the, the, they argue it out but they i think the problem is irresolvable because they have they're very close to the point where the government simply cannot expand much more without decisively ending the private property system and there is no political force which has the slightest interest in doing that at the moment so and you would have to build one somebody would have to build one which would be it's a long and historical process to do that, I think. Yeah, it's interesting that th there are a few uh, people on the, in, the, in the economics profession, particularly on the kind of post-Keynesian left or however you want to describe it, that, um, that do invoke the kind of World War II model, oftentimes referring to this or that kind of minor text by, by Keynes and so on and so forth to try to evoke the kind of scale of intervention that's necessary. But as you say, that 
scale of intervention is going to, at a certain point, kind of tip over into a kind of a command economy, yeah, which would in some sense, <laughs> which would which would in some sense uh, defeat the point, right? I mean, um, so um, let me let me ask you a little bit about the, the economics profession because I think this is a, one of the the things that I, I most like about your work um, is your contention that in some sense, if you actually look at the the track record of the economics profession. You see that for for decades, if not for its entire existence, um, there's just complete inanity when it comes to trying to propose even a kind of minimal sense of the direction of um, of capitalist economies over the course of uh, a business cycle or a couple of business cycles or, or so on and so forth. And that it's and it's in some sense you could say its predictive powers have been revealed to be completely uh, you know sort of debilitated. Uh, time and time again, um, maybe like, you know, almost every single <laughs> instance yeah. in which you can find an example. I mean, 2007, 2008 is a great uh, recent example, but I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about this question in the context of, of Larry Summers' remark, because I mean, you, you'll remember it's something, it's pretty hilarious, right? He says something like, this guy is, you know, he's, he was, I think he was a treasury secretary under Clinton. He was he's a treasury secretary, yes. One of the most important economists in the world. And he says essentially that there's three possible scenarios. <laughs> Is either a lot of inflation, there's deflation, there's a boom, or there's you know there's a kind of long stagnation. Depression. I don't something like that. But it's basically yeah. every single scenario, and he actually rates them at 33 percent for each one. Yeah. He's like, well, so that you know basically anything can happen, and I have no idea. Nevertheless, of course, he's labor. You know, he's. He spent a great deal of energy arguing that we, we have to watch out for overheating of the economy and blah, 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 because God forbid there be inflation. Um, so yeah, I, maybe you have some thoughts about the, the economics profession, in particular, the way in which the profession has a special kind of prestige in our culture, despite the fact that it's been wrong, like almost as a rule. Um, and um, maybe you can also sort of talk a little bit about this notion of a folk which you invoke at one point to yeah, describe folk science. The, the actual ideological function of the profession as opposed to, as opposed to its, uh, its sort of scientific aspirations. Uh, Jerome Ravitz, who was a British philosopher of science, who wrote a very beautiful book about the nature of science, coined the phrase folk science, but it's a generalization from something philosophers like to talk about folk psychology as, a, as another folk science. It, the idea is that People, people, there's sort of common sense ideas about how the, some aspect of the world works. And then people dress it up in very fancy terminology. And so that it looks like science, but it's actually, its actual function is to sort of reassure people that the way the world is at the moment is um, very well organized and there's nothing to worry about. Um, to go, Marx, Marx had the idea, and I think he was correct, that when people began to, to talk about the economy, which was around the time that the capitalist economy came into existence in the late 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, when you began to have what was then called political arithmetic or political economy, people, these were people who were actually trying to figure out what was going on. They were scientists. They they, and that some of them were pretty smart. Adam Smith is a fantastic, uh, very, very intelligent person and very curious, or Condorcet, I think is another very important thinker of that period, who really tried to understand the new society that was emerging, how it worked, and to, to develop a new set of concepts to talk about how this new, cap what was going to be capitalism was different from the earlier European social systems. But um, by the 19th century, it was pretty clear what capitalism was and how it was working. And they were also very big, uh, big as a, because of the clarity of what capitalism was like and how it was working, there were large movements already developing, contesting it and opposing it. And it's, I would say it became more important for the people who are shapers of thought and who are the official thinkers of society to be able to explore why the world was well organized than it was for them to actually have to understand it. They didn't really have to understand it because it was already there. But, you know, when Adam Smith was writing the wealth, capitalism was just sort of a 30% constructed. But by 
by the 1880s, it's full blown. It's a big machine. It's just off all uh, in, in half of the world. So the, the economists didn't really have a function anymore in guiding the emergence of the system. And they, uh, they took on the new function, which was that of what Ravitz calls a folk science, which is reassuring people that everything is okay and everything is going to work out. And at that moment, they gave up the possibility of understanding how it actually works. And the result of that is, as you say, the complete and total failure of the economics profession from the point of what is supposed to be very fundamental to science, which is predictive. Uh, I, I remember even 20 years ago, I read a very interesting article about somebody actually studied predictions over several years. And they discovered that each year, somebody did the best predictions, but it was never the same company or economist two years in a row. But every year, somebody would be the best predictor. And then everybody would hire them. The companies would hire them to get their predictions. But the next year, they would fail completely. It would be some other person. And by already by 10 or 10 years ago or so, the companies had just stopped hiring economists to predict. They, the whole uh, profession of economic prediction making was something that the businesses were, who had, they were believed in it in the 50s. They all had economists who were predicting and they just dropped it because they, they figured out these people have absolutely no idea what's going on. So we might as well just read the get stock tips from you know, whoever it is in, in the newspapers. So they, they stopped predicting you know, partly. And also I think there was a change which is that the companies began to operate on a much shorter term basis and in making investment decisions. Um, I used to know a guy who was a who worked to Citibank, who was a, 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 a trader at Citibank, and he was in He told me he was in charge of long-term strategy, and I that he said six weeks. So as opposed to the, most of the people who do short-term strategy, which is ten minutes from now or tomorrow. So. If, if what you're interested in is what's going to be happening in a month or six weeks from now, you're not interested in some economist explaining to you what's going to be going on in a year if we, the government does this or that, since apparently they don't know anyway. But it is quite remarkable that now I think the faith in economics as a science is really declining. Just, just you know, um, there have been a number of telltale signs of that. There's even this guy Mr. Dean, who's the head of the Council of Economic Advisors to Biden. And he just poo poos the whole thing. He says, we don't really, nobody really knows what's going to happen. You know, it's probably going to be okay. And the important thing now is not to theorize about inflation, but we just have to get money to people because otherwise everything is going to fall apart. That's by now, people are very free talking about the unpredictability and the lack of knowledge that anybody has. And it's, I don't think anybody takes seriously for a minute when some Republican senator says, if we give people money, they won't go to work. You know, they know that's not true. You know, it's, it, it's been shown over, you know, there's always right. some social scientist who goes to work and proves that it's not true, but nobody cares. I'll say it again anyway. That, but nobody really believes, I think, in any of these things anymore. It's yeah, a, which, which again makes makes the the prestige of the profession itself uh, curious or a kind of riddle, right? I mean, no, it's it's a historical artifact. artifact it's because yeah. they emerged they emerged out of out of World War II and the, out of the Depression, World War II. They were not very important. You know, there were always some advisor. And Keynes was an important person, although everybody, you know, the ruling class in England really didn't do what he told them to do. Right. And he completely disagreed with the official policy, but everyone thought, well, he's a very smart fellow and he made a lot of money on the stock market right. and he's very witty. And then, <laughs> and then it turned out that he was already sort of doing what he, he proved theoretically was the right thing to do. Hitler was already spending government money to hire the unemployed and build highways. And so then it's, oh, he, he figured out a way of showing why that works. But it was already working before he fixed. So then he became famous. And then came the problem. Then there was a, a real, there was a serious problem of reorganizing the world after, after the, especially with the shift from European power to American power after World War II. And have to have, you know, they had all sorts of people, but there, Keynes, 
Keynes came to Bretton Woods. He had all sorts of big ideas that nobody paid any attention to because that actually didn't suit the needs of the American business people. So, however, because of the depression, a giant upsurge in prosperity after the war and after starting in the, in the mid 19th. And the economists, because they had, they were there by then, they were already sort of employed government giving advice and uh, being officials of, and policy makers, they got the credit for it. So everybody thought, oh, these people, it's amazing. They, they're producing this fantastic prosperity for us. Although they had, in my opinion, very little to do with it. The other thing which they did, which was very clever, which is they began using very large quantities of very fancy mathematics. And that always impresses people because nobody can understand mathematics. Yeah. They think, you know, physics is very smart. And the, so the, the economists were literally very con self-consciously copied the physicists using their, their, their differential and making models. And so it, it sort of looks a lot like a science, whereas in the rest of the social sciences, it doesn't look, you know, psychology doesn't really, didn't really right. look very much like a science. But here you had people with equations on the blackboard and it was very regimented. So there was an official line that everybody sort of had, or maybe two official lines that were fighting with each other. Um, but if you looked at the detail, you could always see that it was just cuckoo. You know, if you went, if you looked at a, an economics curriculum, they would teach the theory of, of pure competition, and then they would teach the theory of impure competition. Right. So which is it? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the idea that, you know, and of course, neither one really describes what's going on. But I think that that faith in the scientific nature of economics is just on the wane now. Now I think they're just sort of doing what they can and... They barely, they barely can muster the theoretical energy. Like Paul Krug, a Nobel right. Prize winner, he has nothing to say. But people need money; we should give it to them. Let's not worry about inflation. It's probably not. It hasn't been a problem for years. Why should it be a problem next year? This is not scientific reasoning. It's just, you know, anecdotal chit chat. So, but those are the big thinkers. Yeah. Well, I think that, I mean, summer's uh, division of, you know, it's one third, <laughs> one third, one third. I, I thought that was really beautiful because of course I'm it intimidated by the, by the kind of mathematical sort of, uh, you know, extravagance of the profession. And so for him just to sort of make it really, really clear for me, <laughs> that yeah. it could be this, that, or the other in equal, uh, you know, anyway, I, I let's talk a little bit about- I prefer Olivier Blanchard. He said, I have no idea what Yeah, I have no idea. I mean, it's, it's, it's <laughs> kind of beautiful in a way. Um, yeah. It just sort of, you know, all of that, uh, <laughs> all of that kind of apparatus, and that's what you yeah. end up with, right? Like, um, maybe we, should talk a, we should talk a little bit about Marx. I mean, because, um, in some yeah, sense, we're going to do maybe some <laughs> some statements. I think, but I think maybe I'll I'll just sort of throw a couple things at you and Please. see what you have to say. I mean, because in some sense, you've already gotten into the kind of meat of what I I wanted to to, to talk about was this idea of science and in particular, the kind of scientific nature of Marx's project, let's say in contrast with the scientific claims that, that uh, economics is a profession or bourgeois political economy or what have you, uh, and it's either classical or, or vulgar format, um, the scientific claims it makes for itself. Um, and in particular, try to kind of put a sort of, um, a kind of clear, um, what's the word, kind of concise sort of um, characterization of what's scientific about Marx's theoretical project. Um, and I have some thoughts on that, but I mean, I, I'm not sure exactly which way to go with it, but I, well, I, in some sense, I want to talk about Marx as a, as a kind of, as a kind of, as a, as a theoretical figure and Marx as a kind of political figure. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, think about the relationship between those two, two things, but I, I don't want to start there. So, so maybe let's um, talk a little about Marx, uh, Marx's theory as a kind of, uh, as a kind of an account of the long-term tendencies of the capitalist mode of production and think about the extent to which his attempt to, in some sense, formalize what he calls the laws of motion of the mm -hmm. capitalist mode of production is in a certain sense a predictive type of science and therefore mm -hmm. uh, corresponds to our kind of ideal idea of what um, a science should be. Well, at the same time, it's predictive in a very particular way in the sense that it makes no claims to 
determine at any particular time based on whatever quantitative verification that it could you know, uh, bring to bear. Um, it, it makes no attempt to, in some sense, at an empirical level, make prediction about what take place in the near to middle term. That in some sense, it's really a question of trying to think about secular tendencies of the, of the um, capitalist mode of production and to verify maybe in some sense retroactively through kind of patterns that one can see developing over the course of uh, decades, really, um, half centuries. Um, the kind of uh, tendencies that he lays out at a kind of theoretical level. And what I mean by this, and this is something I think that you, you say in probably a, a more uh, um, sophisticated way and refined way, but I mean, what's interesting about uh, Marx's account of the kind of long-term tendencies, the crisis tendency of the capitalist mode of production is that if you look at the last 50 years since the late 60s or early 70s, what you see is a kind of pattern of not only an increasing number of crises, that are kind of taking place sometimes at a systemic level, but oftentimes taking place in kind of region like mm -hmm. East Asian crisis, crisis in South America, you know, Mexico or Argentina, mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. What you see is a, not only a kind of a, a kind of concatenation of crises that are taking place um, in shorter and shorter intervals after one another, but those crises are on the one hand much deeper. Uh, um, in a kind of progressive manner, they become deeper and deeper over the course of their uh, unfolding um, at the level of you know several decades, but you also see that recoveries tend to be much shallower. Mm -hmm. So what what's what's going on there in the strategy is not a kind of quantitative account of, let's say, the decline in the rate of profit that's somehow measurable according to whatever data that can be mm -hmm. sort of resourced by you know Marxists who work in economics departments and so on and so forth, but rather more of a kind of excuse me a kind of a qualitative account. Um, which is empirical in a certain sense, because we can see very clearly that the recovers, recoveries are shallower, the crises are more, more frequent, and that the, the actual um, depressions or the, the kind of recessions are deeper and deeper, right? And so maybe in some sense, we can talk a little bit about the way in which that functions as a certain type of scientific account of these laws of motion that we're talking about without it being predictive in a kind of narrowly empirical or quantitative sense that we might mm -hmm. expect Marxists to provide us with, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I actually think that's, <laughs> you, everything that is, is profound and it's the, most, it's the most fundamental thing. I was thinking originally when we were given the title, what we talk about when we talk about Marx is, my first answer was, well, people talk about everything when they talk about when there's Marxist theory of art, Marxist theory of sport, Marxist theory of history. But, uh, and Marx himself was interested in very large numbers of things. And as you said, he had political interests and views, and he also had what he, he considered a scientific uh, set of interests. Paul, I think you froze. Uh, I think I think Paul is frozen on us. Um, maybe he is. Well, I think that uh, Paul will be back with us shortly here, I hope. I, I thought I'd come in and, and be a okay. stand-in until Paul came in. Uh, uh, but I think, that, you know, the, a lot of the points of the discussion, the question that the difference between an Adam Smith, who really is trying to find out how the world works, it's yeah. a genuine science, as opposed to whatever goes on now, you know, is a fascinating, uh, a fascinating question to turn. Thing out. I know that there's there's a book on uh, uh, the Nobel Pri Prize in Economics, uh, uh, which essentially was developed by the Swedish bank uh, years afterwards, right. 
and its goal was to uh, lend prestige to economics at a time when Keynes was the only economist in the world who anybody knew. So it became, you know, it's from the Swedish bank, it's like the Lenin Prize, Stalin Prize in genetics, you know, it has that sort of credibility. And right. it's there to raise a profession to give it the kind of Einstein glow that it doesn't have. I see Paul is back, so I will, uh, I will retire and stop trying to impersonate him. Oh, you got to unmute, you got, Paul. You're, you're muted. Yeah. Paul, you're muted. Uh, Let me unmute, go. but I, I'm looking at uh, basically blank, a blank screen. So let us see what is, I'm, I'm claiming I'm not a robot. I don't know. <laughs> the well, we can see you and hear you, so I think- Okay, so I'll just start. Yeah, just um, I'm, I'm always happy to see, see you, but eventually perhaps I will be able to uh, get back online. Um, so I was saying, Marx had a, a very profound understanding and for which I think the physical sciences of the early 19th, of the 17th through 19th century as a model, or he would have used the phrase laws of motion. Um, and the, I, what he saw was that the, the, at, least, at, at least in one kind of science, I don't want to say this is what science is because science is many different things, but in central kind of science and particularly the ones that have been called the, the hard sciences like physics, um, depend on thinking abstract, that is to say, to construct a simplified model of the situation that you want to understand because reality itself is simply too complex uh, to, under to be understood through the collection of large quantities of information. For example, if you really, want to, if you want to understand the relative motion of objects in the solar system, you actually can't carry out the calculations. You have to operate with it with a very simplified. I think we might have lost Paul again. Yeah, we seem to be having technical difficulties. Uh, uh, we will try to persist until Paul uh, comes <laughs> back in. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll make a few remarks uh, that were, I was gonna sort of feed them yeah. back and forth between Paul and myself, but maybe I should just say a few things. Uh, yes, please do, please do. Um, while he's uh, sort of figuring out how to get back to us. I mean, I, I certainly, I, I think that um, this question of abstraction that Paul uh, brings up, which is really, really important one. I mean, I, I don't have the, the kind of, um, uh, at my fingertips, the kind of refinement of his own account of um, the nature of, of the scientific abstraction and even what he calls idealization of Marxist theory. But I think that in kind of a, a kind of intuitive sense, I think that the notion of abstraction and how abstraction works is, in Marxist theory is really, really important one. And I think that um, for me, the way I think about this is that Marxist theory basically gives you a set of categories, kind of analytical categories, which at the conceptual level are incredibly clear. And there's a kind of uh, total clarity or transparency to these, these theoretical categories, even though of course they're very difficult to understand. And, and uh, in some sense, we, we still don't understand some of the nuances of Marxist theory. And yet at the empirical level in actual capitalist societies, um, there's incredibly complex mixtures. Um, and uh, let's say there's a lack of conceptual clarity that at the level of the kind of theoretical abstraction is present. And so one of the examples I would give to, I mean, one of the ways you can think about this in a kind of very, very intuitive way is the notion of class. In Marx's kind of theoretical account, as opposed to his political writings, um, you can see the notion of class is developed at a high, very, very high level of abstraction. And um, it's also incredibly sort of fragmentary. Um, you have like at the very end of what counts as volume three of Capital, you have a theory of class, which in some sense seems to be only a kind of fragment of a much larger, what was going to be a whole book, right? 
But what's interesting in, in, in Marx's theory of class or, or his um, kind of theoretical account of class is that it's very, very difficult to map those categories directly onto observable, empirical, kind of sociological reality. Um, maybe, maybe even more kind of interesting um, sort of way of thinking about this uh, for my own purposes and maybe in relationship to the, the book that you mentioned earlier, Philip, is that, um, is that Marx, you know, distinguishes in a way that's actually quite uncertain in a lot of ways, theoretically, but he distinguishes between what he calls productive labor or productive laboring activities and unproductive laboring activities. And what's fascinating about this distinction is that at the level of like the the theoretical abstraction, it's relatively easy to make a distinction between those activities which are productive of value and those which are not. But when you actually look at the way the capitalist economy is organized and the kind of private economy is organized, it becomes very, very difficult to say where <laughs> productive activity is happening and where unproductive activity is happening. And there's a lot of reasons for this, which we can get into. Um, I was hoping uh, Paul could clarify this a little bit, but, but one of the things, for example, is if you look at, a, at an individual worker in a particular firm or what have you, it's often very, very unclear whether or not that worker is performing so-called productive labor or not. There are certain examples which are extreme, which allow us to think about this in very, very clear terms. And Marx will give the example, for example, of a cashier. It's quite clear that the, what a cashier does is circulates value rather than produces value. And so that kind of labor that's being performed by the cashier is going to be unproductive labor and therefore uh, labor that doesn't produce value, but in fact, is a cost to capital, as a kind of necessary cost to the, for, for capital if it wants to valorize uh, or realize the surplus value that's generated in the productive sphere. But when you start looking at companies, for example, or entire sectors, it becomes even more unclear um, what kinds of activities uh, are productive and what kinds of activities are unproductive. And there's a lot of examples that people debate, you know, uh, in kind of very funny ways about whether transportation is, is productive or unproductive. And that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that the kind of, the, the level of abstraction it requires to make this distinction is one that in some sense transcends the kind of individual uh, worker or, um, or company or even, even um, industry. You know, in some cases, like there's cleared certain industries are, are, are unproductive, like finance or what have you. Um, but there are others that are where it's much more complex uh, kind of question. And I think in some sense, that's the point of Marx's theory on some levels. He doesn't want you simply to apply these categories as a kind of classificatory system to this or that laboring activity and then draw whatever conclusions you might have politically or otherwise about them. Um, what's at stake for Marx is thinking about these long-term trajectories of the capitalist economy and thinking about the fact that at the level of the total economy, the, the total mode of production, it's necessarily the case for reasons that have to do with the inner logic of capitalist mode of production itself, that there will be a rising relative to productive laboring activities, there'll be a rising ratio of unproductive to productive activity. And he gives an account of this, again, in, in uh, volume one, but also volume three, um, he makes very, very clear that this is an important long-term tendency within the capitalist economy. And he doesn't say that at a certain point that that ratio, if it reaches some kind of quantitative uh, sort of point in its, in, its, um, in, in its progression or what have you, that this will have X effect. In fact, of course, he's quite sensitive to the fact that there's all sorts of countervailing tendencies within the economy or within the kind of dynamics of, 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 of the capitalist mode of production, which can in some sense counteract that tendency. But, but nevertheless, the tendency is that there will be a rising ratio of unproductive to productive activity as production, uh, capitalist production expands at a kind of greater and greater scale. Um, so that's the kind of level of abstraction that I wanted to sort of emphasize is that, that on some level, it's not a question of looking at this or that company or this or that worker, or this or that activity and saying, oh, that's productive and therefore it's good maybe, and that's unproductive and therefore it's not good. Or this is a more politically viable uh, or politically relevant uh, part of the working class or the economy as opposed to another one. So that's, that's one way in which I think about this question of, of abstraction. Um, and it's kind of relevance to analysis, uh, the kind of analysis that Marx proposes. I think, Paul, are you back? Yeah, Paul, are you back? Do you have audio, Paul? Uh, 
Well, uh, we'll keep talking here for a second. Yeah, yeah you know, it, it seems that some of the concept, Marxist concepts, abstract concepts, are fairly easy to understand right away. Uh, the fact of accumulation, MCM prime. Yeah. Uh, it seems to both be working in the economy and it's something you can grasp at an abstract level. Or uh, the notion of uh, the fact that, that uh, the whole economy is directed not towards satisfying needs right. as capitalism presents itself. We're the most productive economy in the world. We can deliver everything to everybody. Possibly if it, was do, if it wanted to do that, but what it chooses to produce is not dictated by what people need. So those are abstract, but they're fairly easy to understand on a total system way. Things like abstract labor and the notion that uh, somehow value is created behind the back of the protagonist. It's not something where you take every individual labor who is shoveling stuff and you get that kernel of value that just crammed into uh, the product and is congealed inside it, but right. somehow behind the back of every person, uh, what's created is connected to the total social capital. Right. And some sort of mysterious calculation is made where you come out with values, you know, or, you know, that stuff is a little harder to understand, but I suppose that's the quantum theory side of uh, the science in Marx, which is to say that, uh, something uh, particle can, doesn't have a location in quantum theory. You know, you can't have the position of, uh, and the velocity at the same time or something. So, th so those would be the, the kind of odd uh, things that can't be apprehended directly, but can be presupposed, I guess, in Marx, the way they are in quantum theory. Paul, <laughs> you're back. Well, I'm there, there you are, Paul. I don't know what happened, but... Uh, <laughs> I've uh, plugged into the phone, so now I. <laughs> oh, good. I'm going to stay here in reserve in case I need to okay. talk to if you uh, if you cut out to some distant realm. So thank you. I'm glad to be back. So what did I miss? Well, I you know I, I quickly sort of made a few points about uh, abstraction in Marx's theory and its relationship to the kind of empirical complexity, and I and I used the example of productive labor versus unproductive labor. The very, very uh -huh. clear theoretical categories that in some sense, even though of course Marx isn't that clear in the way that he, he, uh, he uh, discusses these, these uh, categories, but in some level, at the, at the level of theoretical abstraction, one can clearly distinguish productive labor and unproductive labor, or, un or productive labor that's productive of value and labor that's not productive of value. But in, if you actually look at the economy in a, a kind of empirical way, it's oftentimes quite, um, unclear whether, for example, this particular worker or this particular firm or company, or even this particular industry is actually performing productive or unproductive labor. It's quite clear in certain cases, you know, the example of the, of the um, feels like a, I'm getting an echo a little bit. Um, so, in any case, I was just trying to talk about this question of, of the, the kind of theoretical abstraction and its relationship to kind of empirical analysis and looking at, uh, for example, uh, this or that sector of the economy, this or that company, this or that worker, and the way in which, in some sense, Marx is never uh, attempting to, or he's not providing a kind of theory that would allow you to identify this or that moment as being productive or unproductive, again, the, the examples he gives as illustrations are, 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 um, are obvious, um, but rather he's thinking about these kind of long-term tendencies within the economy in which he says quite clearly, it's necessarily the case that the, the tendency is for the ratio of unproductive to productive labor to rise over time. There's counter tendencies and he accounts for those as well, but that's a, that's a long-term tendency that has nothing to do with the kind of analysis which would want to identify, for example, that cashiers are unproductive and therefore we can make some argument about what their place is within class struggle or within, you know, within some kind of larger class dynamic. So that's kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm repeating myself a little bit, but that's kind of what I was trying to get at while you were away from us. And I don't know if that's a useful way to think about abstraction, but for me, it's important because in some sense, um, 
these abstractions cut across, in some sense, it, for all their clarity, they cut across empirical uh, sort of um, phenomena in a way that uh, in some sense, um, if one wanted to apply them to empirical, you know, sort of sociological phenomena, you're going to have lots of confusion and uh, arrive at the wrong conclusions about what Marx's, the point of Marx's theory is. I'm actually very tickled that you used that example because I think I was probably cut off while I, but while I was talking, that was, I, I actually gave the example of your book. And, ah, okay. Uh, it's a demonstration that Marx's long-term prediction of the increase in, The, the increase in, is that okay? Yeah, there's an echo, unfortunately. Okay, let me, you know what? Let me just do directly. It's like Steve Reich or something like that, you know, kind of early Steve <laughs> Reich, like you. Try it now without the microphone. I mean, without the headphones. Right. Okay, let's try that. <laughs> oh, I know what the problem is. It's because the phone is on at the same time. <laughs> that was the problem. Okay. I was getting. I was getting feedback from the phone. Okay, that's better. That's much better. There's, okay. a, a, there's a good question from Phil Neal that kind of ties together something that Jason and uh, Paul were talking about, the, the, essentially about the relationship between the very abstract model of Marx and those parts of conventional economics that in fact might have some information to convey and might be usable. Uh, since Paul is one of the few people that works on both levels and, and distinguishes them, I'll just read the a question, it goes, uh, 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 oh wait, it must, have, it must have resolved down here, here. Both of you, are, and Jason too, both of you engage more or less equally with in-depth abstract topics and value theory and with more surface level features of the economy as they appear in conventional business statistics, all while being attentive to the limits inherent in these measures. But this union is not particularly common. Often the two are bifurcated in practice with some thinkers discussing just the abstract critical value dynamics and others essentially replacing these wholesale with conventional econometric stands in. Can you speak to the nature of this tension and how you avoid falling into either extreme or even just talk a bit more generally about the nature of measurement itself in relation to critical theory? Well, I think that's something that both of us will have something to say about. The important issue here is that, of course, um, the whole point of having an theory is to understand what's actually going on in the world. And it seems as though economic data is a way to find out what's actually going on in the world. Uh, on the other hand, the problem is that the data which are available are not very suited to the terms of Marx's analysis. For example, uh, very central to Marx is the idea that the rate of profit on capital tends to fall historically over time. Uh, but the problem is that the rate of profit that Marx is talking about is the rate of profit of world capital, something which exists only conceptually. There is, it's not measured. There, there are in fact no data for the rate of profit on, on world capital, just as there is actually no data for a capital, because in order to construct such a number, you would have to be able to uh, convert between all the different currency systems and you would also have to be able to correct for the difference between the actual capital values in Marx's sense and the prices that things sell for, which are influenced by, for example, uh, the functioning of the financial and credit system. So you could say uh, it's impossible to, to check Marx's prediction of the decline of the rate of profit because there's simply no data for it. What most Marxist economists 
deal with this problem is they say, well, we can, we can look at the rate of profit in the United States and we can see whether it goes up or down at different periods and try to just see if that fits Marxist theory. But of course, the United States is not the same as world capitalism. It, in order even to know whether it would, its uh, behavior over time would function as a model for the global system, you would already have to know what the global system is, which is you, for which, which you do not know uh, empirically. So that means if you want to think about Marx's um, prediction about the decline of the rate of, you have to approach it not through seeking economic uh, data from government or business sources, but you would have to look at some other kind of indicators. For example, the, the rate of investment or, um, uh, whether you are whether uh, prosperity lasts for very long for indefinitely long periods of time, or if there is a tendency towards um, towards crises and depressions or recessions, as we like to call them now, uh, all of which in Marx's scheme are explained by as as results of changes in profitability. So I think, for example, you could say, uh, given the of the world economy that Jason sketched a little while ago, it seems quite clear that Marx's prediction of a tendency of the rate of profit to decline over the lifetime of the system has been um, uh, invisibly uh, uh, realized, but you could not prove this by, by collecting numbers from statistical sources for, prop, for the profits of corporations and adding them together. Uh, so, I, I, the, the problem for the Marxist theorist is that you have to find ways of discovering in the mass of experiences and uh, even to some, a certain extent in, in, uh, statistical data that exist, um, features Uh, Paul, it looks like we're having technical problems again. I wonder what. Um, Sean, Ranjan, do you have any ideas here to help Paul? I think he might be having computer issues on his end. Um, yeah. Not clear what we can do. Um, all right, well, I guess he'll try to get on again, yeah. Um, well, I, uh, Jason, the other thing is, of course, the problem of getting good statistics uh, from companies that are putting out deceptive statistics. Uh, yeah, all sure. the transfer pricing which they use to allocate profits in, in places where it's most profitable to be to be profitable. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, also the, uh, uh, I, I've read somewhere that, that one is allowed to list debt as an asset on certain, on certain types of balance sheets. So, I mean, how one would even penetrate that maze, you know, or go, go into structured investment vehicles and find out uh, you know, where the money's going and what it's coming it would, be, would be incredibly hard to calculate, even though at the same time, Bill Gates keeps talking about data-driven as the kind of buzzword of the present. It seems right. that anybody can more or less manufacture to a certain degree the data that they need or the data they want, either by uh, manipulating things or even by buying a particular expert to uh, testify on behalf of that data. So it, it's very hard. Adam Smith would have had a horrible time at the moment of trying to figure out how capitalism actually functioned. Right. I think that, yeah, I think that um, I, one of the things that I, I read in the course of writing my little book on automation was that, is that, you know, the, the, the rate of business investment since 2000 has just completely collapsed, right, in the, in the US um, and in, in Western Europe, particularly the UK. Um, I don't know if Paul is. And, um, but one I'm of the here. things that, there he is. Okay.
Paul, can you can you hear us? I can I can hear okay. you. Yes. All right. I don't know why this keeps keep... coming and going, but it does. <laughs> uh, well, we were just keeping the you know the yeah. fire stoked uh, while waiting. For yes. You. We could try, try another question here. I think. Well, no. I want oh. to say I was I was saying when I when it just I was that uh, Jason had very similar issues in in writing the book about. Uh, labor. So for example, with questions of productivity and unproductive labor and what do you, uh, what, what count as data for discussing uh, such theoretical issues? Maybe you would say something about how you solve that pra practically. Yeah, I, well, I, I don't know if I solved the problem, but I think I raised a, a set of questions about um, the question of what, how productivity is measured. Because of course, in some sense, the, the way that my, my book is structured is that I begin at the kind of surface level uh, and I describe what everyone else describes. And so in some sense, I'm merely reproducing the kind of accounts that more or less everyone has about corporate debt, for example, zombie companies, stock buybacks, so-called tech companies and their, all the innovation that they're, they're doing. And so the moonshots that they propose, uh, all mm -hmm. the self-driving cars and, and so on and so forth. Um, but then I try to actually look closely at one particular factor, which is the, which is the, um, the rate of growth of labor productivity as it's tracked by, you know, kind of the Bureau of Labor Statistics and by economists and statisticians. And of course, you can see a very, very clear trajectory um, from 19, really the late 60s to the, to the present. Um, and everyone talks about this. It's not, I mean, you know, the bank of, Mark Carney, when he ran the Bank of England, uh, used to write a paper a week, you know, talking about the so-called productivity crisis or the productivity paradox that, you know, so-called post-industrial economies find themselves kind of mired in. But at a certain point when I tried to really, really, uh, what's the word, kind of like take on in a kind of um, serious the theoretical way, the notion of how one conceives of and therefore how one measures productivity and labor productivity, I found that the conventional means for doing that were completely incoherent uh, theoretically, or in some sense were completely atheoretical. It was the kind of way that you know, business people measure uh, productivity or business journalism measures productivity rather than an actual theoretical account of what constitutes productivity. And to some extent that means that, um, that working economists and working business journalists and so on and so forth have no actual theoretical concept of unproductive labor whether that be mm -hmm. characterized as being distribution, circulatory sort of, or circulation labor uh, and so on and so forth, or whether that be thought of as, as activities taking place in the, in the public sector versus the private sector and so on and so forth. And so in some sense, what I tried to do in the kind of more theoretical middle part of the book was, was really think about um, what it means when we talk about productivity and labor productivity and what we're actually measuring when we do that. And in some sense, uh, I, I, I would say that I make no attempt to actually propose an alternative measurement because I, I wouldn't be able to do that in the first mm -hmm. place. Uh, I don't have the, the skills or the, the background to do that. But I also think that theoretically and maybe politically, it's not necessary to do that. That a different type of, of conceptual framework is necessary for thinking about the relationship between what the business class, economists and so on and so forth, political class call, um, declining rate of labor productivity growth and what we actually should be thinking about when we do that. And so what ends up happening there, and on some level, I would say that I don't have theoretically or methodologically this question worked out in, in the way that probably I should, but in some sense, I, I, I sort of take the data as a kind of index for a kind of theoretical discussion that might mm -hmm. open up into a different type of discourse. And one that doesn't make any claims to, to measure empirically uh, a phenomenon, but rather to explain in a more coherent and maybe more powerful theoretical formulation what I think is actually going on when we talk about declining rate of, of, mm -hmm. of productivity of labor. You know, so I think really that's a question. It's a very complicated good, question. Yeah, but that's a very good example, I think, for uh, uh, responding to Phil's question. That you know, that that's it. There's a constant back and forth between what you call the sort of the level of everyday reality, which is theoretically incoherent. And then the attempt to think abstractly about it, to realize it and to uh, formulate uh, some, some way of making sense of the patterns that are discernible in the, in the, on the, in the experience of the economy. 
Um, I would like to know what Phil's uh, account yes. is because he also does that yes. kind of work as well. I mean, you know, exactly. uh, <laughs> with all his different hats. Well, as soon as he's through with his dissertation, who can right. we'll quiz him. <laughs> tell us. Are there other questions? It seemed to me that we were, I was glad that we were sort of moving into a question period. Nope. Philip, I think you're, you're muted. God, okay. You think I know that? Okay. okay. So uh, do you see any difference between uh, talking about that lowest sort of factual level about trying to find out how people actually do business and trying to look through, uh, look through various accounts? Do you see a split between uh, very good business writing and economics? Uh, in other words, has business writing kind of stepped into the void that disappeared when institutional economics was axed, uh, you know, and something like Veblen's theory of a business enterprise is, you know, they, they were very interested in how people got capital. Mm -hmm. And certainly Minsky was when mm -hmm. he sort of went back to that institutional economics. But it seems that if you really want to find out how a firm operates, uh, if you're lucky enough to find a good bit of business writing, you'll learn a lot more from reading that uh, than you would from an economist who's doing microeconomics or whatever. Yes, I think that's completely true. That the, the, in, in general, they, the economists are not better than the business writers, but they tend to introduce a lot of nonsense into uh, the, in the information. At least a good business writer will give you useful useful information. So I, I think it's true. I, I, I spend much more time reading business journalism than reading uh, articles by economists. There's much more actual information. It seems because to me that- they, Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I'm just gonna say that, you know, for Marx on some level, if we're, we're, since we're talking about Marx here a little bit, I mean, on some level, that's what vulgar economics is, right? Is the collapse yes. of eco economy yeah. or economics into, um, into kind of business journalism and economics takes yeah. on the role of a kind of putting a certain kind of uh, illusory, maybe conceptual order into what is otherwise the kind of fluctuations of, of uh, everyday kind of uh, business world. But in some sense, it's a, it still functions as an apologetic and a kind of polishing of, you know, whatever you get out of business journalism rather than there being a real scientific ambition to separate the world of appearances from what he calls the essential relations or the, the kind of deep inner logic of that might be the inversion of what we actually see, of course, when we look at the business world. You know. no, so I, I, the, I disagree yeah. with that a little, Jason. I think actually it's uh, the role of economics decorated with mathematics to serve as, a, as an apologetic. Uh, I think uh, maybe more so in the 60s and 70s than now, there was a business writer named Martin Meyer who would mm -hmm. put out books about Wall Street every three years, The Bankers, Nightmare on Wall Street. And you know they were changing the rules so quickly in Wall Street in those times that you would get a lot of information from each of these stories, uh, which were genu driven genuinely by the attempt to find out what was happening. It wasn't obviously a Marxist analysis that linked this to the forces underneath that are pushing these things. But, but uh, in economics, you know, whether it's general equilibrium or whatever, you know, uh, you know, when, what is it, Eugene Fama says, I don't know what a bubble is because in his theory, there can't be bubbles. I mean, th this has absolutely no relation to trying to figure out how the economy is op operating and what's true, you know? So I think not every business writer, obviously not Andrew Ross Sorkin or, or those people, but you know, sometimes as Paul said, you do really get information about how a company operates like Uber right. or whatever. And it's really you know, amazing the more you read about it. But you have to provide your own framework to put the information right. in. Yes. That's the problem. Uh, I'll give you another question that came in. Uh, Paul, you discussed economics as a folk science earlier. In mm -hmm. other fields like sociology or psychology, the folk critique is often leveled against particularly questionable approaches and practices. I wanna turn that around a little bit. For both of you, are there folk Marxisms or folk positions within Marxism? What parts of contemporary communist and socialist analysis 
need to be thrown out? What survives? Um, that's actually a really interesting and wonderful question. And I can tell because I, I really have to think for a minute. I don't have a ready answer. But I would say part of the problem is that um, there was there was always in the heyday of the old socialist movement, you could say a kind of folk Marxism. Um, for example, I remember when I was a teenager going to economics classes by, run by some little Marxist party. And you learned about the labor theory of value and how labor was the substance of value and how it explained the exchanges of goods, all of which is not actually what Marx was trying to talk about or what he was trying to say. I, 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 could, I would say this sort of, there was, uh, I would say the normal, there is a kind of normal Marxist leftist version of Marxist theory, which you could call on those terms, a kind of Marxism, which doesn't really grasp what Marx was trying to do on the, uh, to the degree of abstraction that he was functioning on and which tries to in, in terms which are immediately comprehensible, uh, we're, uh, referring to everyday experiences in ways that don't really get at the theory, which is rather complicated and, and uh, um, difficult to, to understand because of the, the level of abstraction, because it departs so much from, from uh, the experiences of everyday life. So just as I would say, there was probably a, a folk Marxism, which had to do with the idea of building an organization, whether it was a party or a trade union of gradually accumulating people by convincing them of your point of view so that they would be ready someday to take over the world. Uh, I would say that, you know, there you could say that the whole, there was a whole apparatus of left-wing thought, which was connected to the practices of the traditional left-wing movements and labor movements and the little parties, whether they be sects or larger social democratic parties, which uh, depended for their own ideological purposes on a kind of half-baked version of Marx's, Marxist ideas. The Marxism that you study when you read the handbook of Marxism that they published in the Union in the or if you read Stalin's books about the essence of Marxism, that that was a kind of folk Marxism. It was, uh, it's, it, it was part of the life of the part of the life of the party, part of feeling, you know, uh, there are, uh, we are growing every decade and soon we will be ready to take over. Uh, so I think it, it, it would not be unreasonable to say that just as there were as a kind of folk economics, there were there were folk Marxist theories too. I think that they have largely disappeared with the disappearance of that historical left. There aren't really any social democratic parties anymore, and they're really the little sect, hardly of any significance. So that whole world of popular Marxism largely disappeared. Uh, we're, I think, in a historically very un unique moment, like all historical moments, in which sort of that whole apparatus at the left is, is fading away and means less and less to people. And with it, the folk Marxism is dying out. And that makes it possible to reread and to approach all, the, all those ideas of the past to, with new eyes and uh, new ways of thinking about them. Paul, quickly, can you try not to uh, talk and gesture with your hands? I have a feeling that that might be one of the I reasons. I will keep the hands. Yeah, one yeah. of the reasons that the screen may be phrasing up. It's trying to yeah. capture movement. Okay, so, I will stop. Sorry to intervene there. Jason, do you have yeah. a, a response? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know if this counts as folk. folk. First of all, the, the thought I had when, when Paul was talking about, uh, talking about this question of, of this kind of mythology of kind of the socialist movement and the way that Marx plays a role, uh, kind of ideological role within that context is, um, is one that I, I, I thought of. But I'm also thinking about a more sophisticated kind of version of, of Marxism, which is um, 
which is what you know Paul himself calls uh, Marxist economics, which in some sense has a very more complicated hybrid uh, sort of form, which is oftentimes a highly sophisticated version of Marxism. It's not it's not a kind of vulgar Marxism in the in the kind of um, intuitive sense that we have, you know, it's a kind of, you know, highly theoretical and technical version of Marxism, which in some sense tries to ingratiate itself and incorporate itself into the kind of larger profession of Marxism. But maybe that's not what the folk science is, is, is about. I mean, I think for me, maybe this is, this is just repeating certain points that uh, Paul is making is that I, I do think that there's a certain political Marx, the Marx of, for example, the 18th Brumaire, or the, the, the Marx of the class struggle in, in France and so on and so forth, which is a highly, you know, recognized, or the Marx of the Communist Manifesto, like let's say the pre-scientific Marx, who's very much uh, a militant in the socialist movement, who represents a certain tendency within that movement as intervening within these kind of in, insurrectionary situations. That's a Marx which is really, really powerful and important Marx as a kind of exemplary figure um, but in some sense, those writings aren't necessarily that valuable to us uh, in the present, or at least it's very, very difficult to apply the kind of lessons that we seem to draw from those writings to contemporary, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whether class struggle or politics and so on and so forth. And I think that it's very important to distinguish between, I mean, maybe at the level of methodology, you can say, well, there's certain things you can get from Marx uh, that's very powerful. Certainly his tone is something that I wish was more, um, you know, like more present within kind of broader Marxism, the kind of satirical, acidic quality. But I think that Marx uh, is in particular is one that in some sense belongs to the 19th century. And the kind of analysis he's, analysis he, analyses he proposes are ones that don't have a lot of value to us. And in some sense, what we have to do is um, work through the kind of theoretical questions, of course, that this, this more scientific Marx um, uh, sort of proposes and sort of establishes uh, as a kind of framework. But we have to kind of invent this kind of translation into the political space or whatever, a political context. And, and for me, in some sense, you could say, well, you know, the, the 19th century Marx, uh, the political Marx, and I have much to say about this, but, but on some level, that is a less relevant Marx for us, even though you see lots of uh, political Marxists of various sorts uh, who oftentimes will, will, when they're trying to explain Trumpism, for example, they'll go to the 18th Brumaire or what have you in this, this kind of way that's just like, oh my God, you said that about every <laughs> other phenomenon for the last 150 years. Um, but I do think that what Marx really, really gives us that's really, really powerful, and that's not simply a kind of theoretical framework is, is a kind of theory of class composition and the kind of changing composition of the working class um, in a way that transcends his own historical moment. I mean, if you read like, particularly, um, let's say the first volume of Capital, I'd say chapter 15 and chapter 25, you can really get a sense of a kind of theory of class composition, which is totally applicable to the present moment, um, but which doesn't necessarily take place at a level of theoretical abstraction um, that a lot of the other, let's say, aspects mm -hmm. of his, his theory um, uh, do. And so, so for me, that's, that's the question, but it, it really requires, this political question requires a totally reinvented um, way of thinking about revolutionary politics or communism or what have you that um, Marx isn't that useful for. I mean, for example, his notion of communism to me, maybe I'm wrong and I'll, I'll be corrected if I'm wrong. I think his conception of communism, for example, when he uses that term, uh, particularly in his later later writing, um, it's it still owes a great deal to Robert Owen. In fact, much more than is is usually um, acknowledged. And in some sense, you get a much more powerful kind of at the, at the descriptive level, a much more powerful vision of what that would mean in someone like Kropotkin than you would in Marx. And so, in some sense, there's this whole world of Marx as a political actor and as a writer that um, that might function oftentimes for uh, people who see themselves as socialists or what have you as a kind of, not, not a folk science, but as a kind of reliable image that they can reproduce um, rather than trying to really, really think through the present moment in a different kind of way, so. Yeah, but, I mean, I'm always surprised that people will go to the Communist Manifesto to quote Marx on capitalism without thinking that, well, he wrote this stuff before he went to England and actually, actually <laughs> studied it up close 
for 30 years. I mean, I think we're talking about the, the soaring Republican oratory that makes a lot of sense in terms of rallying people together and making them want to move beyond capitalism, but analytically to get stuck with like base and superstructure as opposed to, uh, I, I'm told that Marx barely uses the words in all three volumes of uh, Capital, I haven't counted it. It does seem that the, uh, the, the Republican oratorical part of Marx is the 19th century part. Um, mm -hmm. What we're looking at is uh, an incredibly complex model a, a social theory, the paradigmatic social theory, is Marx, uh, Marx's uh, model of capitalism. There's nothing that's been deeper, that's been worked on longer in the social sciences than that, you know, and that can serve as the basis of a scientific research program, my opinion. But, but you've been mentioned Marxian economics, that strange kind of hybrid uh, uh, under folk science. I wanted to try to pose pose the question this way. Uh, um, there has been an attempt to kind of, I think, uh, um, may launch together the critique of political economy with some elements of uh, mainstream economics to come up with a, a more valid economics than the one that's trying to, uh, to uh, be a, a, a booster for capitalism. How would one reconstruct, what elements from mainstream economics could one use not to combine with the abstract levels of the model, but basically uh, to find elements of a kind of a somewhat empirical economics that would try to reconstruct uh, what's going on around one. Uh, I assume it would be macro rather than anything in mi microeconomics. I mean, it might be, uh, I don't know, input output stuff or, but, but I mean, in terms of constructing an economics that was usable, rather than one that was there to occlude what really happens in capitalism. What do you find that's usable in mainstream economics? I personally find almost nothing usable. I, <laughs> and even in the, in the macroeconomics, its basic concept is the concept of growth. But right. growth already, in, uh, economic growth, the thing that is measured by GDP, changes uh -huh. in GDP. But this is already, from a Marxist point of view, a completely nonsensical concept because right. it mixes together expansion of the government system, expansion of debt, and the actual expansion of production. These are these are completely different things. Functionally, they are differently. They meetings for the development of the system. I, I think that in, in in every area, almost uh, almost um, theoretically. They, that the, the standard economic theory has nothing of interest to contribute. The only things which are usable are certain, I would say, very empirical studies, which are very close to what you call uh, business journalism. For example, I, got a, I was very interested in reading a, a report that was written by four, three or four economists on the Asian monetary crisis. And they just look in detail, you know, how did it develop? You know, what, what were the problems? And if, if you read that with an eye to more general questions, you can see, oh, sort of at the root of it is people were making bets on the profitability of investments which didn't pan out, that actually there was a kind of general profit collapse. And then all the debts which had been accumulated to buy land and speculate in various areas and, or in various currencies in order to to uh, make money in the future didn't work out. And that spread very quickly with the collapse of financial institutions. So it's actually a very, it's, it's both an unbelievably complicated story in, in terms of the de mechanical detail, simple story in conceptually. So I, I think that you get a, an interesting flavor of the complications of the real from, from Kind of study, but the attempt by the attempt by the economists who wrote that study to understand and explain what was going on is pathetic. You know, with that's uh, like contagion. They notice that you have a crisis somewhere, and then you have another crisis somewhere else. How do they explain what's the relationship between these two events? Contagion. 
It's like a disease which has been caught by, they, they, they started sneezing in, in, in Bali and then soon they were getting sick in Mexico. And then the Russian bankers are also catching the same kind of illness. But this is not, it's not, it, this is not a serious way of explaining uh, uh, complicated social phenomena. So I actually think there is really uh, probably nothing of any theoretical value in economics as a as an academic field. Uh, and Jason, that, you, have a, you have a thought on this? Well, I, you know, I, I think that the, the, the notion of Marxist economics, as I understand it, is really uh, sort of indebted to, to Paul. You know, Paul talks about this at great length, actually, in Theories Critique. I think it's basically an entire chapter on it. Um, and so I have nothing to add, but I do think that as a, as a, there is a, an interesting story about why it is that at a certain point, especially in the 1970s and 80s, um, more and more attempts to, let's say, complete Marxist theory using, you know, usually kind of Keynesian derived concepts become, you know, more and more prevalent within usually an academic context, right? I mean, you can trace the, the phenomenon of, of Marxist economics back as far as, I think in Paul's case, he, maybe Rudolf Hilferding, certainly Paul Sweezy, people like that. But there's really this kind of influx uh, of people into the academy in the 70s and 80s maybe oftentimes coming out of, out of social movements that have wound down in various ways. Uh, and they may be thought of as being responsible in some sense for, an, for, a, for seeing a need to supplement Marxist theory with some kind of Keynesian dimension, like maybe a monetary theory that would be somehow more sophisticated according to their own uh, professions account of what monetary theory should look like or uh, a theory demand which somehow is missing in, in Marx and so on and so forth. And I think that story is kind of interesting um, to sort of account for why it is that there's a phenomenon like Marxist economics rather than, you know, um, yeah, so. Uh, so it's, it's not even that complicated because if you actually tried to be a Marxist in an economics department, people would just think you were crazy. They wouldn't talk to you. Students might or might not take your classes, but they would quickly learn that you can't use this stuff, job or write it, write it. And then your colleagues would also just think you were nuts. People are not, it's, it doesn't belong. It's a different, it's like a different framework. It's, uh, it's like going, it would be like going to an astronomy, a, a department of astronomy and trying to teach astrology. And people would just think, think this is an idiot. This is not an economist. This is a, he's doing something else. And they would be correct. I really think you know Marxism is not uh, Marxist theory is not an economic theory. It's a criticism or an attack on economics. It is not a variant of economics. And uh, the economists know that perfectly well. If you start talking that stuff, they just think you're an idiot. And in, in just and in a sense, they're right. You don't really belong there. So it's very hard for a normal human being to, to try to work in a field where every you're completely it doesn't want to talk to you. You try to find bridge. You try to find a way to discuss with them and rephrase your ideas in a way so that they can understand it. And most of the Marxist economists that I know personally, all of whom are very sincere and many of them very nice and intelligent people have spent decades trying fruitlessly to, to convince their colleagues that they are correct and that they are not crazy and that Marxist theory is the best economic theory. It never gets anywhere because you can't do it any more than you can convince a bunch of astronomers that they should start believing in astrology. It's just not going to work. But that if that's your world, you try to be part of it and to regard your colleagues as rational people who want to discuss with you, but they don't want to discuss with you because they don't think you're rational. So that's just the way it is. So every discipline turns into a cult for a while, but you know, uh, if you look at the parallel case of analytic and continental philosophy, which seemed like a gulf that was almost unbridgeable for many years, uh, the number of but that's because they both collapsed. What? They both collapsed. They both collapsed. <laughs> Especially anal analytic philosophy was almost a total failure. I, and I say that as I was trained as an analytic philosopher, and there are many things I love about it. But it, it, the main thing it was trying to do is understand science. And it right, right. a total, total failure. The program simply didn't work. 
They, and the program with respect to, to logic and mathematics didn't work. The Hilbert was not provable. Uh, ma mathematics could not be reduced to logic. So the, the whole real serious hardcore program of philosophy just sort of collapsed. And all those people who I knew who were serious analytic philosophers, after a while, they just began, oh, think, oh, well, let me, I'll write a book about the movies. You know, why right. should I keep beating my head against the theory of language, which I don't really understand? I'll write about the movies or about uh, feelings or, uh, you know, the whole, and so then you might as well, that before you know it, you might as well studying uh, Husserl and Heidegger. And so I, I, I actually lived through that moment where the collapse of academic philosophy delivered them to, uh, to the, the, the bullshitters on the other side of the- so of Writing the about Hegel, which is what a lot of them do now. I only meant exactly. to say that if that, can, if that yes. can happen and it never looked like it could happen in the 80s, maybe no, someday, why not? there'll be enough yes. of an economic turbulence. Yes. Some of them will Very good example. To, Very uh, good example. Uh, the, uh, my other question, let's see, I, I have two questions. So one of, uh, um, let's, let's look from the present moment and get your take on uh, what might happen down the road here. So, so we have a situation where uh, companies are getting all their money from short-term money markets now. Uh, overnights, repos, commercial paper, and so forth. So they're trying to preserve their liquidity. At the same time, the, 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 the best investment, according to Goldman, is the most illiquid investment, investment of all, which is coastal real estate in North America. So money is pouring into all of those things, raising the event, the rents in Seattle and Vancouver and so forth. So you have two uh, different imperatives, the desire to get in and get out of everything quickly and then leverage yourself completely and throw the money in, in into real estate. Some people say that the, the only way the economy can keep going like in a cartoon or something, one of those things where they lift the hood of the car and it's just a mouse uh, running around in a treadmill mm -hmm. in the motor, uh, it is simply by keeping inflating the real estate through some form of QE. How do you see it's the next five years? Yes. Say what? Well, Coastal real estate, of course, is a short-term investment, <laughs> as we know, because of global well, warming. That, oh, that's true. But, I mean, that's, yeah. But uh, no, that's, that's exactly it. They, any, it's not just real estate. People are pouring money into Bitcoin and to, into Ether coin and right. Dogecoin. Anything that looks like you can, you can push money through it, make in, in a short term more money with that's so it, it, I think that real estate is just one of those things and it, it's a basic one and, and has been for a long time but these are even that is these are these are you know they're not buying real estate thinking oh in 200 years I will be the owner of vast estates they're they're thinking you know I, I will turn this over or I will extract some money from renters and then in the well next I think it's months. rental real estate that's yeah. going no, they, you no, know, no. they have the, they're yeah. looking for income streams. but the one thing that they are not a, the, that they are not doing is investing in productive enterprise no so we are now living that's in a, this is a a, a nearly full, this is a, a, we have never been so close to a nearly full-blown speculative economy as at the present, which I would say, just to come back to Mr. Marx, is a, is a sign that we are, at, we are at, at a very acute state of the decline of capitalism as a productive social system. Jason, so, you, you buy that? Yeah, I, I agree. Maybe we should maybe we should end on that note. I mean, yeah, it's, yes. uh... <laughs> we we should, but there is one more question that okay. I would like to get. Okay, the last question: the Savior to talk about the Savior. Uh, okay. It comes riding in on a horse, and it's called MMT. Will that will that work? And if not, why? A modern monetary. Why, theory. How do you? Why and what work is it? How do you count because... for MMT's growing prominence in left circles today? And how should Marxists relate to the MMT analysis? Well, I'll say one thing. I, I you know, Jamie Merchant uh, published a really, really long and, oh, yeah. and really brilliant uh, article right. on this question, this very question 
I think about two or three months ago in the Brooklyn Rail. And so um, I would defer uh, to that article in particular, but maybe Paul has a more um, pithy way of approaching this. Or maybe, maybe Paul's frozen again. Oh, Paul, are you frozen? I love your backlighting in this thing. <laughs> you, look, you look like something out of Batman or Somebody Friday has... the 13th there with, uh, well. <laughs> yeah, it's like the savior and the kind of, you know, the sort of- I think it was that. actually the prospect of MMT that froze Paul on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to, uh, to say goodbye to everybody with Paul off the uh, off the the screen here. I give him a second to come in so he can uh, join the goodbye. Jason, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. What are you working on now? Uh, I'm writing something. Uh, well, I can only say this. I mean, I'm writing something um, on the first anniversary of the George Floyd Rebellion. Um, and I'm hoping to publish it June, you know, um, but it's difficult. <laughs> so that's what I'm, that's what I'm writing right now. Um, it's not a large project, although it might become something bigger, but that's what I'm working on. So. Is it in field notes or? Probably, probably, yeah. I mean, I, I would, that's where I would send it, so yes. What, what are you reading now? Uh, well, Du Bois, number one, uh, Black Reconstruction is a book that I, I think- Oh is yeah. Very, very, um, and I've been rereading uh, James Boggs' American Revolution, because I think that's really a book that for me, um, uh, I think can help clarify what happened in some sense in June and then also what's at stake in the, the rebellion uh, and what he calls the American revolution, you know, that, that's to say a very specifically American form uh, of revolution. And so, um, so that's what I've been, I've been thinking about uh, recently. The last, I mean, like this last two weeks. You know. Yeah, okay. well, great. We look forward to that. Uh, Paul, we wanted to say goodbye to you if you've managed I'm glad to, I returned in, in time to it, say goodbye. If you've managed to, uh, oh, great. I, I, you, you're wonderfully backlit here. You look like Friday the 13th here coming in through the door. Maybe, maybe Halloween I'm thinking of. Let me know. just say, for uh, those who are, if that, for your person who's interested in MMT, read the article by Janie Merchant in the uh, May Brooklyn Rail. He explains it right. extremely no, well and clearly. Yeah. All right, we'll leave it with that. So everybody, uh, person who asked the MMT question, go online to the Brooklyn Rail. The nice thing about it is uh, Field Notes has all its, it's articles always there. Yeah. accessible, so you can find them if you know the three or four months yep. back and read Jamie Merchant's uh, uh, essay on MMT. And also any of these things on economic nationalism and why it's not going to work. Yes, you know, all very you know, good. Written some excellent stuff. Does Jamie, Paul, you were going to tell me what books are coming out and uh, uh, down the road in uh, in the field notes series. There's going to be a book by uh, Dr. Crudy and Jared Shanahan on uh, on mass incarceration and the, the American police state, okay. and a book by Jamie Merchant on economic nationalism. So those are the those are two that are in, in the pipeline at the moment. So, all right, well, great. I'm, I'm looking forward to them. Thank you, thank you very thank much. Thank you very for being much. Here. We, we, I, I think we made it through on, on, on we did. extreme circumstances. I feel like yes. we've been on deck in a storm. In, but we in finally a storm. are arriving in a harbor <laughs> now. And we all seem to be all right. So, Jason, always a pleasure to talk to you. Paul, it's nice to meet you. Nice I, to meet you. We will have you in person at them. I'd that would be fun. When we ever go back to uh, having Real life. those things. So, uh, okay. and thank you all for thank you uh, all. watching and thank you, Sean and, and uh, Ranjan for uh, helping us get through. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Okay, I think we... Yeah.